Please tell us about the order and how you came to discover it exists. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. The order is truly a secret society. It was founded in the United States at Yale University in 1833. It has continued and exists down to the present day. Each year, the order takes in 15 men, senior students from Yale University. Never more than 15, only once has it been less than 15. In 1946, they took in, I think, 10 rather than 15 members. So what we have is a secret society which, over the last 150 years, has accumulated about 2,500 members, of whom perhaps 500 are alive today. Of this 500, perhaps 100 are actively in pursuit of the objectives of the order. It's not another college fraternal society. Yale University is the only university in the United States, or indeed the world, which has senior societies. These are societies where the 15 are selected in the junior year and actually are initiated at the beginning of the senior year. They stay on campus only one year as members. They are called knights. When they graduate, they leave the university, they go out into the world, then they're known as patriarchs. So at any one time you only have 15 knights in existence and um, for the rest of their lives they're known as patriarchs. And they work uh, during their lifetime, or a number do. Uh, towards the ends of the order. They are pretty much guaranteed success, certainly they're guaranteed financial success, and in my reading of the material I have, I uh, infer that so long as they go along with the purposes of the order, so long as they uh, gear their careers and their lives towards certain ends, then they are guaranteed success. How did I come to this knowledge? Well, up to six months ago, I denied that there was a conspiracy because, frankly, I couldn't prove one. I suspected a conspiracy, but I couldn't prove there was one until six months ago. Well, a little before six months ago, um, I received the catalog, which is the membership list of the society, all the way back to 1833, and I received some of their internal documents, enough for me to put together the way they correspond with each other, the um, operations within the order, to some extent their problems, and to some extent their objectives. Now this is the book, An Introduction to the Order, by Anthony C. Sutton. It has a skull and bones on the front and 322. The 322 is an identification. The um, order has a temple on the Yale campus. A Within, temple? A temple, yes. It's a building maybe this 50, 60 feet by 40 feet, maybe 40 feet high. There's no windows, two big steel doors. We know what the temple looks like because back in 1880s, uh, a number of Yale students became a little unhappy about what was going on inside this temple. Well, they, when they went by it at midnight, sometimes they heard strange noises and all kinds of rumors on the Yale campus as to what this might be. There was a break-in. I call it the Yale Gate. Uh, <laughs> there was a, there was a break-in to the temple, and the students who broke in. Uh, cataloged what they found and they made a, um, a drawing, a design of the interior of the temple. And uh, three of the rooms are numbered. One is 322, one is 323, and one is 324. Uh, 322 is also, I suspect, the chapter number. Uh, and also in correspondence between members, they conclude their correspondence where you and I would conclude yours truly or yours sincerely. They conclude yours in 322. Why 322? There are several theories for this. One is that the order uh, 
originated with Demosthenes, the Greek, in 322 BC. That's one theory. Another one is that it stems from the founding date in the United States, which was 1832. So really we have um, the last two numbers, 32, the second chapter of founded in 1832. The skull and crossbones are prominent in the in the um, ceremonies, initiation ceremonies. This is a symbol of death. Now why would they take a symbol of death? Yes, from what I understand, when a new member is initiated, that would be in the senior year at Yale, he's placed within a coffin. Oh my. And, uh, <laughs> And now we only know this from the Yale Gate papers, at least I call it Yale Gate. Um, and from the photographs we have of members inside the temple, um, many of these photographs are the 15 sitting around a table and they have the skull and the crossbones sitting on the table in front of them. It is the symbol of death and it has been called the Brotherhood of Death and I think it, it probably more adequately should be called the Brotherhood of Death. So what I've had to do is look at the history, the biographies of the leading members of the order and reconstruct their career and see if there's a common pattern in their careers. Uh, while doing that, I came across some interesting documents. Some members apparently are not too happy once they become involved with this after 10 or 20 years. One member in particular left a memorandum. He wrote it in 1932. He was buried away in his papers. I don't think anybody uh, found it before I did. And it was a six-page memorandum on the order, naming some of the members and said it was the most sordid thing ever happened in the history of man. So, but to come back to my point, I have to reconstruct the objectives. What are the objectives? In the words of one member, might is right. If you have the power you use it to achieve your objectives. What is the objective? As you look at the histories of individual members, it can only be one thing. To acquire power, to keep power, to use power for their own purposes. That year, that senior year, selects the next group from the junior class. Um, within the order, each 15, each group of 15, uh, are known as clubs. I call them cells because they're very close to the Jacobin cell, the revolutionary cells, but internally they refer to them as, as, as clubs. Each club has an identifying number. For example, Avril Harriman is, is a, a very influential member of the order, the son of um, Edward Harriman, the railroad magnate. Um, Harriman was initiated in 1913. His club number is D111. Um, all, his, all the other 14 of D111 have died off. Avril Harriman is the only one left. To come to the other part of your question, who are some of the significant members? Today, two men stand out. One is Avril Harriman, who is the, I suppose, the chief financial angel of the Democratic Party. The other is Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, the Bush family is uh, quite prominent within the order. Now, if you go back in history a little, you'll find that George Bush's father, Prescott Sheldon Bush, was also a member of the order. He was a member of Brown Brothers Harriman, which is the Harriman Private Banking Company. So today you've got two men who are supposedly in politics in opposition. Bush and Harriman, actually the members of the same secret society, and Bush's father was not only a member, he was a partner in the, what was then Harriman and Company, which later became Brown Brothers Harriman. So behind the scenes, and this is something you don't see until you investigate it, people who appear to be in opposition politically or financially or industrially or in many ways um, are working together. Other members might be William Buckley. Now, William Buckley became a member in 1949, but the preceding class to that was Bush, 1848. So you get Bush was amongst the 15 who selected Buckley, and Buckley's club, that 15, was 
the 15 that selected, for example, one of the new members for 50 was the Reverend Sloan Coffin, Jr. The Reverend Sloan Coffin, Jr. at Yale was at the core of the anti-Vietnamese um, and anti-Vietnamese war disturbances on Yale campus. This is typical. You'll find that men in the same society will take opposite positions in public. So you've got William Buckley, whom I call a House Conservative as a member, but so is a man, for example, called Edwin Burt, who has a string of communist affiliations, which is about that long. And we'll get into this later. The method they use is that of the Hegelian dialectic. Thesis played against antithesis leads to a synthesis. In other words, for Hegel, for history to make progress, you have to have conflict. And when you look at the key people in the order, you will find that they generate conflict. So Bush and Harriman politically are conflicting. Um, Coffin and Buckley, although part of the same order, are in public conflicting with one another because conflict leads to the new synthesis. Other prominent members, one of the most prominent was Howard William Taft, the only man to be both President and Chief Justice of the United States. The Taft family founded the order in the United States. There have been eight members, eight Taft family members within the order. Um, uh, Taft was uh, probably the most prominent member around the turn of the century, 1910-1920, uh, Stimson, who was Secretary of War under Taft, then Secretary of State under Hoover, Secretary of War under Roosevelt. Uh, in other words, um, at that level, politics disappears and people often wonder why does a Democrat join a Republican administration? If you check back, you'll find out there's not as a member of the order. So key people would be people like Taft, uh, Stimson, um, Archibald McLeish, who wrote the Constitution for UNESCO, also a librarian of Congress, uh, the Bush family, the Walker family, um, and above all today, if there's a godfather in the order, it's Avril Harriman. Exactly what causes does the order espouse, and why are these divergent to those of our founding fathers? Well, the causes one can only deduce at this point from the operations of these men as individuals and working together. Um, they want to acquire power above all. Power Political to do what? power. As you look at their actions, the political power is to bring about what they call a new world order, which is a one world. But they use the Hegelian techniques, and we know enough about Hegel to know that not only does this mean the dialectic process, the creation of conflict, but it also means that individuals such as you and I, or anybody watching this program, will be cogs in the state, that we have no individual rights. Our rights for, rights for Hegel, individual rights for Hegel, come about through obedience to the state. Uh, we see it in the educational process, which we'll probably talk about later, that we have adopted what I call a Hegelian system of education, which is not to bring out your innate talents, but to prepare you to be an individual cog in the state. Now, are you saying the members of the order believe this and this is a part of their worldview? I would say that there is a minority within the order that does believe it. There's one thing I've learned in looking at the papers that they're not all active. Maybe at any one time only 20% are active. Undoubtedly the 20% that are active have this goal. If you look at Tuft, Tuft's great work, although as a president he hasn't accounted for very much in the literature, Tuft's great work was to bring about uh, the world court, international law. International law and a world court will be essential in a new world order. If you take, for example, the career of Bush, Vice President Bush, when he was ambassador to the United Nations, he helped a process called Mundialization, uh, which was a process by which an individual American city would adopt a um, United Nations uh, statue. In other words, it's a diminution, a dilution of U.S. sovereignty. So if you look at these individuals, uh, Stimson is another very good example. Avril Harriman, certainly, in the way he's financed the Soviet Union, his work towards the build-up of the Soviet Union. If you look at these individuals and ask what is the common pattern, the common pattern is the creation of a one world. 
Now, supposedly, these people believe that they are great benefactors of our society, the wise men, those who are especially endowed to rule, and who also believe that uh, the best interests of, the Ameri of America happen to be their own best interests as well. I have never seen anything in the literature which um, um, leads me to believe that they have our individual rights in their hearts. What I do see in the literature and in the documents is a, a, um, a ruthless drive to acquire power for themselves and to help each other because this is one of the tenets of the order that if you have three men coming before you for a job the preference absolutely goes to your brother in the order this is um, in my book the order introduction to the order I, I call these chains of influence and I trace one pattern where Stimson uh, brought the McBundy family into the War Department, then the McBundys go on and become key people both in Department of Defense and in the Council on Foreign Relations. They help each other along the way. And when you get even a small number of men doing this, uh, it can exert a very powerful force, a very powerful influence. So the basic assumption is that because they know what is best for America, the way to preserve that is to amass power to see to it that the destiny they envision comes to pass. My assessment is they're not thinking what is best for America, they're thinking what is best for the order. What is best for order the order first. is what is best for America in the first in their eyes. order. Yes, in their eyes. Yeah. What's good for us has to be good for America, so we will remold America mm -hmm. according to... The pattern. That's right. Yes. It remains secret for 150 years because these people are under an oath not to talk about it. I understand that a member of the order may not remain in the room if it comes under discussion. Now, if I can elaborate on this a little bit, this poses a problem for Mr. Bush because I write something called the Phoenix Letter, which is a monthly newsletter, and last November I began to open up. And a reader wrote to Mr. Bush and said, uh, is what uh, Mr. Sutton says, are you a member of this order? And the letter he got, the reader got back was very interesting. Um, it said in effect that the vice president was not a member of a sordid secret society. That was not the question. The question was, are you a member of a secret society? The answer came back, he is not a member of a sordid secret society. <laughs> I inserted the word, you see. Uh, this was a reader who doesn't give up, so he went back again. <laughs> and um, I understand that uh, as it stands, as we are now, that Mr. Bush is not willing either to admit he is a member of the order or to deny it. Because they're under this oath not to discuss it. So when people look at the Council on Foreign Relations, in effect what they've been doing is looking at a kind of a veil which hides the order? Yes. Uh, the core, or my work, came about almost by accident. If someone had not donated to me the membership list, we wouldn't be here today. It's remained secret because nobody has done that. Everybody's been looking at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Tridatal Commission, the Bilderbergers. They are not truly conspiracies because the membership list are open. The membership list of the order has not been open. So there's a distinction between the CFR and the Trilaterals and the order. CFR and Trilaterals are not conspiracies because they are not secret. They do what comes back. <laughs> and this, of course, is very different to argument to many people who have promoted conspiracy have made. They get across the idea that these people telephone each other and have little drawings and maps and diagrams. They don't operate like that at all. If you meet these people, they think alike. They talk alike. They come up with the same ideas simultaneously and they move simultaneously. They know what they have to do. So they're a breed. They're a breed. Exactly. Now, Tony, what has this breed done? What are their chief accomplishments in molding uh, domestic and foreign policy and actual events in American history since their founding at Yale? One is they have acquired enormous political and financial power. You'll find representatives of the order in politics. As well, what have they done with this power? What, have they, what has happened to okay. America that would not have happened had they not been the order? Uh, creation of war and revolution. Specifically, which ones? I, the, third, on the third book 
in this series which I'm bringing out takes two wars and one revolution. Well, two revolutions, excuse me, two revolutions in one war. Uh, World War II, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the rise of Hitler, which I call a revolution in Germany. We can find the order behind the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. We can find the behind the rise of Hitler. We can find the behind, we can find the behind in the maintenance of both of these systems, the now, transfer of technology to both. Since you've already proven that Wall Street is behind the Bolshevik Revolution and the rise of Hitler, now you're proving that the order is behind Wall Street. Exactly. Now who's the key figure in the order or figures that uh, mold Wall Street? In order of dominance, Avril Harriman, partner in Brown Brothers Harriman. Uh, Stanley, of Morgan Stanley. It used to be J.P. Morgan, then it became Morgan Stanley. Stanley. Uh, those two are the key. Now, what did the order want to accomplish in the Bolshevik Revolution? You create opposing forces which you place in conflict. Out of conflict, you've got profit. You've got political power and you can direct history. And if you look at the writings, for example, of the Trilateral Commission, they talk openly in the Trilateral Commission about managing conflicts. Not solving conflicts, but managing, managing conflicts. Conflict. conflict management, that's the, that's, the, um, that's the cry. So they got the profit, the power, and the management. Mm -hmm. Where do they want to steer history through the Bolshevik Revolution? They wanted to set up, and they did, uh, two opposing forces. Out of that came World War II. Uh, there were logical steps in the process. They used the same bank, Guaranteed Trust Company, as the conduit for the financing of Hitler and also as a conduit for financing and also the early days of the Russian Revolution. In fact, in Russia, Soviet Russia in 1923, a vice president of Guaranteed Trust Company was the foreign director of the Ruskom Bank, which was the first Soviet overseas bank that was set up. They were that close in those days. You will get a very close relationship between the early Hitler days and members of the order, which is in the third book. I think the order has been at war with the United States in general since 1833. There's no question about that. When you look at their individual actions. And that, that is because if the flower of the United States, the flower of freedom, was to become what its potential was, mm -hmm. their very elite positions would not have a stronghold. Exactly. Exactly. The greatest single threat to this breed that has antedated Christ is the nation that has has itself founded upon a constitution right. that guarantees absolutely guarantees the rise of the individual mm -hmm. this is one of the problems they cannot live with the bill of rights in fact uh, this is why when archibald uh, mcleish a member of the order wrote the constitution for unesco uh, it was built into there that unesco would gradually try to erode press freedom, freedoms in the trilateral commission you find the same criticism too much freedom of the press. There's just too much freedom for these people. They can't live with the Constitution. They tried to change the Constitution through the Fund for the Republic uh, down here in Santa Barbara. Uh, they've not been successful yet, but they realize that there are roadblocks they've got to overcome to achieve what they want. The most unfortunate thing to me is that when the people have coming at them from all directions, uh, this momentum of the order, uh, they turn and espouse the order or they let these people, or have in the past, become their idols, accept that they are an elite, accept that fact that they are superior, accept the projection from them to the people that they're superior. Yes. And uh, today you will find fr uh, people agreeing with the limitation of freedom yes. uh, in various sectors of this country. For I various think purposes. that's a very unfortunate part of our society, that uh, too many people are willing to abandon freedom for security, or what they see as security. You can get security in a Siberian gulag, but uh, you can get uh, you know, freedom in, a, in Hitler's concentration camp. You know, but uh, too many people are willing to, um, to um, give up freedom for security. Too many people are willing to look at these people as miniature gods. And because they have achieved power, don't ask how did they get power, 
or what they're going to do with the power. But just the fact that they have power makes them a god and therefore they worship them. This to me is unbelievable. People, I put in one of my books, we've got 20, 30 million degree holders in the United States. People have earned a college degree, but they don't question the statements which are made by these people. Well, it's an amazing thing that people, educated people, can accept that the interference with private property rights, mm -hmm. or with the press, or public assembly, or religion, free speech, the interference with that can somehow be necessary to the, conti to the mm -hmm. continuity of the republic, yes. or the security of the nation. Um, it's ridiculous. I can't answer for these people. All I hope is that they will examine their own consciences and their own minds. Well, Tony, I think that... Uh, in conclusion, it's very important that we understand how you develop in your third book, which is about to come out, uh, the development of conflict uh, to produce war or peace that they're choosing and uh, how that has worked, let's say, in Vietnam or in the situations that are occurring today in the Middle East where there is great conflict. How is the order managing the conflict we see on the globe today? Well, it's, as I mentioned before, basically it is using the Hegelian dialectic. You establish one side, then you establish the other side, then you bring them into conflict, then you manage that conflict. So you establish Soviet Union, you establish Hitler, you bring them into conflict, World War II. By managing the conflict, you can control the next decade or so. And as I mentioned, um, we built up the Soviet Union. We're building up their China today, communist China. We're even going to send the military technology. So by 1990-2000, we've established the two sides. We bring them into conflict. Now tell me, why does Reagan go along with these agreements with Red China, which he just did, to supply this technology? He's not a member of the order. Why does he respond to its stimuli? Because you've got a group within the administration who are members, who are connected with the order. When you get a group quite capable men working together, they can wear down opposition, they can erode opposition because they're all kind of marching in step. If you get three men marching in step, they can do more than 20 men marching to their own step. Don't make my point here. Mm -hmm. And within the order, for example, or within the administration, you've got, for example, Mr. Bush. Um, and the people around Mr. Bush, Mr. Baker, Chief of Staff in the White House. And gradually you've seen the weeding out of those individuals who are independent. They've, been either, they've either resigned or they've been moved out to other departments. So, in effect, the order has taken over. Very gradually, very carefully, without any fanfare. How is the order then managing the conflict in the Middle East? It's hard to believe that the Arabs or... Uh, the Iranians or the Iraqis are actually under anyone's control except their own. I can't fully answer that today. Many of these questions you can only answer maybe 10 years later when you can look at it in perspective. For example, I can look at Pearl Harbor today and see quite clearly a much different picture on Pearl Harbor than was put out in 1941. I can't look at the Middle East today and make too much sense, except you've obviously got two sides. You've got the Hegelian dialectic at work, you've got conflict being created, conflict being managed. The Marines go in, the Marines go out. Uh, today, what, the Iraq is attacking the Iranian oil bases. You've got the deliberate two sides in these conflicts, the deliberate creation of conflict and the management of conflict. Put it this way, is Castro in Cuba because the order wants him there? Uh, could I rephrase the question? Is a Marxist Angola remaining a Marxist Angola because the order wants him? The answer there is yes, because I know in Angola the Gulf Oil Company is the biggest supplier of foreign exchange to Marxist Angola. Pull Gulf Oil out of there, there's no more Marxist Angola. I can't answer as clearly for Cuba. So Gulf Oil want, wants Marxism? Oh yes, in, it wants, oh, undoubtedly. And Marxism supports Gulf Oil? Oh yes, in fact, Cabinda, the Gulf oil installation in Angola, is, is defended by Cuban troops. But you see, you've got an interesting phenomenon. I you think everyone should hear that one more time. I said ca <laughs> Cabinda, <laughs> Cabinda, which is the Gulf oil installation in Angola, Marxist Angola, is defended by Cuban troops. 
So here we have Cuban troops defending a capitalist so-called cap- monopoly. So-called capitalist. But the one of the first things you learn in this business is forget about cam- capitalism versus communism. That is absolute nonsense. The two are behind the scenes are hand in hand. It's a capitalist well, communist conspiracy. One conspiracy. Mm, yes, but you need the you need the so-called <laughs> conflict between the two to keep people focusing. Look, they keep you looking over there. You know, capitalism versus communism. You know, that makes a nice little picture. You know, you get books on it and films on it. Uh, capitalism versus communism. That's not where the action is. The action is over here. Well, what's the greatest single threat to the United States in terms of Central America, Nicaragua, El Salvador, the government of Mexico, that we need to be aware of in terms of an understanding that it is the order that is arranging things that are very detrimental to the future of this country? Well, there you have a a complex picture. Because um, it's not only a a Marxist movement, it's also a... um, a rebellion against poverty, and there's a bit of poverty down there, as we all know. I had to go across the border into Mexico to realize that. You have the intervention of certain religious groups, uh, the Marinol sisters, the Jesuits. There's another conflicting factor down there. You have, for example, in Panama, where the Panama Canal was handed back to Panama, uh, and there's a story behind that which involves the debts that Panama owed to the United States and the functions of Murray Midland Bank. And of course, Sol Lina was direct to Murray Midland, was our negotiator down there. You've got a very complex picture in Central America. Uh, what it is is the creation of turmoil. Out of it, we will either get bogged down in another war or we'll get a series of Marxist states. But what we're heading into, I think, is an era where the order is willing to back some Marxist states but not others. It will back Marxist Angola. It tried to back Nicaragua for a while. It would not back Grenada. In other words, we're getting to a situation where the good and bad